Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Open Data Institute. My name is Anna Scott, and I'm head of content here. So today, I'm delighted to introduce our speaker for our Friday lunchtime lecture, Tom Smith, who is from the Data Science Campus at the UK's Office for National Statistics. Tom will be talking about data science for public good. Um, if you're watching online, you can join the conversation and ask questions with the hashtag ODI Fridays. Um, Tom has to leave a little bit early today, so we'll be quite compressed. Um, I think about 25 minutes talking, and then we'll have hopefully five to 10 minutes of questions. Okay, over to you. Excellent. Thanks very much, Anna. And I'll uh, do, do pass questions over Twitter and so on afterwards. I'm happy to pick up via that or via email and so on. So absolute pleasure to be back at the Open Data Institute um, and kind of been involved on and off with work around the open data scene for a long time. So one of my backgrounds, I worked on something called the Index of Multiple Deprivation, which is a government um, product, if you like, that's used to allocate and target resources to deprived areas, published as open data, but many years kind of work in this area. Also worked uh, with the Environment Agency. So Mike Rose, who's one of the Open Data Institute uh, folks here, um, helped and work, we worked together and looking at the Environment Agency publishing data like LIDAR. So this is height data, you know, developed or picked up from planes that fly over this, the country, fire razor, radar down at the ground and get you accurate height data, critical stuff for improving flood models and things like that. So we helped kind of open that up uh, for some very interesting kind of useful f um, uses by people outside government. So what I'm going to talk about today, though, is something a little bit different. So this is the work of the Data Science Campus at the Office for National Statistics. And I'm going to give some of the examples of how we're working on collaborative data science projects. I'm going to say a little bit about what data science means, so that might be kind of useful background, and also show you hopefully some of the things that government is trying to do to make use of the sorts of data that's both open, but also data that's held by organisations. So there's lots of data sources out there held inside government, inside businesses, inside charities and foundations that perhaps are too sensitive to publish out directly, but themselves are very powerful and you can get a lot of value from them. So I'm gonna give some of the examples there. I'm also gonna talk about some of the skills that you need. And what the Data Science Campus does is look very much at data sources that require perhaps tools and techniques that aren't your standard statistics. So that's why we're a new group at ONS, um, and we use things like neural networks to understand image data, we look at unstructured text, so that might be case notes, or it might be lots of sort of text feeds and so on. So there's lots of work we do there, which is data sources that T traditionally analysts are not necessarily that, that kind of experience we're dealing with. So hopefully some of that kind of interest and excitement will come out through the talk, um, but look forward to questions afterwards. So I'll start with a tiny bit of, of context. Um, so some of you may not know the Office of National Statistics in depth and in detail. We're the folks that publish data on the economy, so inflation data, GDP, so how the economy is doing, growth levels, things like that. A lot of those economic indicators are front page news. People argue about whether a GDP is going up or down or how fast and is it this percentage or that percentage. There are lots of indicators. ONS pro provides the national statistics that underpin decisions there by the Bank of England, decisions on your pay scales and pay rates, decisions on mortgage levels, that kind of stuff. But we also do things around people and communities. So we run the 10 yearly census which provides the, the bulk of the more de most detailed population data for the country. So this is used to decide where to build the new schools. Are there enough GPs in the local area? Things like census data really give you that kind of background, that backbone, if you like. Um, but we also, as well, do things internationally. So in as well as the economic side, you can imagine trade data is really interesting. But we also have the remit for the UK's Sustainable Development Goals. So this is the UN programme that runs till 2030 and aimed at leaving no one behind. So there are lots of indicators there about poverty and deprivation levels, access to services, that kind of thing, and that's an international aspect. So ONS covers large parts of the, of the country in terms, or large parts of the uh, uh, environment for data users, because all of our stuff is published out. We publish this openly, and the census is one of the biggest open data sources um, for reuse by others. So this underpins critical decisions across the UK. But a couple of years ago, we were given quite a big challenge. And we were set up, well, this came out of a review from, from Charles Bean, which was set up by George Osborne at the time. And this was quite a challenging review. Basically said for economic statistics, understanding the economy, you need to improve your game. You need to step up in the ways that we can use 
real-time data, something around the digital world, digital economy, sorts of data sources that lots of businesses and so on are using. So we need to kind of up our game there. And the Charlie Bean Review really sort of talked about better use of data, absolutely clear, um, but ONS building capability and capacity, recruiting and building data science functionality and capability, and sort of drawing on what was already there, um, and working in collaboration with partners. So I'll come back to this, but this is a big part of what we do. We work with ONS teams, but also externally. We work with groups across government and with industry and business, so, and indeed with academia. So cross-sectoral. So I'm really interested in coming and talking to people who think actually this is something that's interesting and can we partner up on something. So do come and kind of grab me afterwards or pick up on Twitter or email. The active learning and experimentation bit is interesting. It's difficult for parts of government to do that because obviously the language of failure is a tough one. But if you want to innovate and understand how to do things in a different way, you've got to accept that there is a risk. And so there's a trade-off there. So we have to actively experiment and have the risk that in some projects, some things we do might not work. That's OK. We're actively encouraging that in our teams. Uh, for various reasons, we've described as a unicorn campus. Unicorn is a one way of describing a data scientist. Your perfect data scientist has a mixture of technical skills, a mixture of subject matter expertise, whether that's economics or whatever, and a mixture of the statistics and maths that you need to the computer as well to bring those together. So that kind of intersection, this kind of mythical unicorn. And to build on that, we've got various inflatable unicorns, which the FT quite liked and took various pictures of. So our purpose and our mission kind of bringing all of that together at the campus we launched end of March last year so we've been going just over a year entirely new group in ONS we're about 45 at the moment recruited probably about a third from industry as I was a third from across academia and about a third internal government civil service so we've sort of built on all of the strengths of the sectors and we brought in a sort of strength and the capability across ONS very much around data science and building skills for public good and hence the strap line and the kind of title of the talk today. So that's what we're about. And there's a bigger picture here because this ties into a lot of stuff that government is interested in. So perhaps for the Open Data Institute, we're very interested in publishing data out, but government recognizes that actually we have a, a, a mission and task to step up our use of data. So there is a lot of data act science and data analysis and data work going on across government. As John, John Manzoni, our ultimate boss, says, getting data right is the next phase of government, of, of public service reform. So essentially feeding into public services across the UK, improving services and uh, more efficient services and so on. And the reason there is there's big impact. So if we talk about services that you're delivering for everybody in the UK, you're not talking about small sectors of the market or community or whatever. You're talking about the NHS, 70 years old this, to this week. Looking at prescription data and how you can do more effective prescription data has big savings. And I think one of the first projects that the Open Data Institute worked on was looking at open prescriptions and looking at the, the saving from moving from branded to generic drugs, statins in this case. There were huge savings in this kind of thing. When you multiply that up across the UK, 580 odd million pounds saved from some initial work by some of the NHS data science groups. So this is kind of big stuff. So it's not just about public saving, it's also about better services in this case. So the, the kind of interest across the piece in this type of work. So what does the data science campus actually do? We kind of our, our work splits into two themes. The first is around delivering data science projects and that's as I said, is we're focused on new types of data, new data sources, so maybe satellite imagery or unstructured text. I'll give some examples shortly. The kinds of techniques that you need to use those sources, so machine learning and so on. I'll give an example short, uh, examples shortly. And short exploratory research, so innovation and risk, and tying back to this idea that we can fail and we need to try new things. So that's the project and the delivery side. But equally important and of great interest is building data science capacity and capability and strengthening the work across government. So we've set ourselves quite an ambitious target of 500 qualified analysts in this space into government over the next three years, which is our kind of business plan kind of at the moment. 
And that's, that covers a lot of different areas of activity, starting from apprenticeships. So we launched one of the first things we did, the first UK data analytics apprenticeships, taking some cases people straight from school, some cases from degrees that are not necessarily quantitative or in data science, and bringing them in and going through vocational training over a two or three year period, leads to diplomas, degrees, and so on. That's kind of different from your usual m picture of a data scientist, which is your kind of, you know, your physicist with perhaps a PhD in AI and machine learning and so on. But that's really interesting. I think there's great value there. So some of those apprentices have already been offered permanent jobs within the system. So it shows that actually this is a really interesting uh, way of building the pipeline. The second area, kind of things like MSCs, so we sponsor um, university to deliver MSCs for us for different parts of government. Um, and we move that up to PhDs. So we've launched with the Turing Institute, which is the National Institute for Data Science and AI, a PhD in data science for public goods. And the first cohort of that starts with us in September. So that will be, again, kind of a stepping up and working on PhD programs across the piece with universities. So again, we're sponsoring and supporting a number of PhD programs and we're involved in discussions around centres for doctoral training, which is the kind of big area of government interest at the moment. The recent announcement was that government is, and industry is going to support up to a thousand PhDs in AI over the next five years, which is a huge investment. And obviously many of those areas are areas we're trying to build government capacity as well. So that kind of working together across the sectors is really important. I mentioned something else around the data science accelerator. So there's lots of formal training, but there's also lots of ways that government supports analysts internally. And the, government, the data science accelerator that ONS and the Government Digital Service and Government Office for Science run across the piece is a very successful program that's been going on a while now where analysts bid in for three-month projects. You get tools and kit and a mentor for three months to work on a project or an area that's useful for your own department, your own team. And I'll show you an example of one of those projects now. We've mentored, I think, around 25 or so of the last year, but the main project pro program is much bigger than that across government. But there's a really interesting one. If you're a government analyst, and you want this sounds interesting, do get in touch or look up um, on, 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 online and find out details, because it's a very, very good program to get involved in. That's kind of over the, the, the last year led us into a lot of exciting and interesting projects. So this slide is primarily to test your knowledge of government acronyms, <laughs> so, uh, which obviously we'll be running an exam at the end of this and collecting some data. But the point here is that we're working with pretty much every government department, public sector agency, from local authorities through to health and so on. Um, actually, this is, needs to be updated because there's about another 10 projects and mentoring that, that aren't on here, um, but it shows the range. So although we're ONS based, and a lot of our work is with ONS teams, we work across the piece, and indeed uh, 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 outside government. So the outside government one is, is of interest, and this kind of maybe ties back to some of the folks in the room and watching online. We collaborate with groups in every part of the economy or industry or academia and we'd love to talk so if you for example want to look at some uh, data that perhaps you're holding and you think there's something interesting here for public goods or you want to talk about skills development and so on you want to talk about collaboration then do just get in touch so we're open to talk and very interested in kind of coming and finding out more so let's talk about some projects what I'm going to pick is, I think, sort of a, a handful of projects at different stages of development. So, as I said, we're a new group, but we've got very much got the idea, the, the concept of quite rapid projects that explore, innovate, and develop out. So, I'm going to give a few projects that are sort of different stages of development and that kind of fill or hit different areas that we're interested in. The first project, then is around the value of the environment and the data that we have on the environment. So there's a team within ONS called the Natural Capital Team, which essentially tries to value the environment so we can build it into the, the balance book. You know, that, for all sorts of reasons, that's a really important area and idea, because if you can build into the balance book, then you can start saying, OK, there's a value here that we can balance against other types of activity. Now, that's a huge area of, uh, 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 of, of discussion and debate, obviously so. 
But the kind of key point is that we actually don't have very good data at local level on the environment. So if, for example, I work in the NHS and I'm interested in health outcomes, I'm pretty sure that in my field, the environment and local area has an impact. You know, I know that trees and so on have a big impact on air pollution. I know that greenery and open space has impacts on health and well-being. So I kind of want to build that into a model and say, what's the impact to the environment using these environmental factors in my model of health outcomes? Is it important? Could public health be investing in those areas? But I don't have that data set. So there is actually a gap here. And it's a gap that we know we want to try and fill and put something in. So there are lots of things that we could do. But we set ourselves the exam question of saying, we want to produce a geospatial data set across the UK at local level that says something about the local environment, particularly trees and greenery. A lot of data sources we could use, but on what we started off with, can we take image data? And in this case, can we use image data that's collected consistently and comprehensively across the UK? And Google Street View is one opportunity here. You could do this with satellite imagery. You could do this with LIDAR. You could send out a million people and crowdsource. There are lots of things you could do. But this is quite a nice data science project and quite a challenging one in many ways. So we've sampled at 10 metre intervals around the entire UK road network the view that you get walking around urban environments. We sampled this through Google. We've then run this through a series of image classifications to try and get a sense of a, whether those image classifiers work for our problem, and B, what sort of data we get out. And we validated that against, in some areas, we do have crowdsourced data on trees and greenery. And in other areas, we do have uh, uh, assessments of the quality of the local environment. So there's lots of kind of validation sources. I wouldn't call them quite ground truth, but they're sort of along that line. And they give us a cross check. The image classifiers we've used start from kind of green in the scene simple stuff like that through to convolutional neural networks and particular type of convolutional nets called pyramidals, um, which is quite interesting. We get very high accuracy against our ground truth type data sets, around 90% or so, which actually if you're sampling at 10 meter intervals, you're producing an, an ultra le low level or local level data set, that then gives you something that you can use in models and be quite interesting. So for, for us, this was a great project. It looks at methods and techniques and data sources that actually are kind of not your standard statistics, learn something new, produces an output that can be used by different parts of the country, including health agencies, the national capital team we talked about, and everything that we do here is published openly. So our methods, the data outputs where possible, all of the, the write-up and the reports, the code is shared through GitHub and so on. So everything that we can is open on this. Um, so that's our first project, and that one's kind of publishing, I think, this month, so keep an eye out. Second project I want to talk about, something a bit different. Um, this is something that came out of the Data Science Accelerator that I talked about. So it's not an ONS project. This is something from the Hydrographic Office. They bid into the Data Science Accelerator for three-month mentoring support, which one of our data scientists and a couple of the data scientists were involved in. Essentially, the question here was, Hydrographic Office need to or ch charged with producing maps and data on the, the marine environment so charts and maps and things like that what they're interested in is what can we say about stuff that we don't yet know about so could we produce a regularly updated live time map of hazards or uh, uh, items objects in in marine environments based on data sets that perhaps aren't charts and the rest of it so essentially what they were looking at was satellite imagery. So can you use satellite imagery to produce maps of new objects or moving objects? And they kind of cut a very, uh, you know, short, a short story even shorter. Within three months, and with some mentoring support from our, our group, what the hydrographic officer managed to do was train a model based on an area where they had data they could build the model against. So in this case, radar data and use it to identify things like wind turbine arrays, oil platforms, shipping and so on from satellite imagery and produce that in a worldwide way, which then enables them to have, if necessary, a, an updated as regularly as they get the satellite imagery. And there's a lot of satellite imagery out there, so you can do that daily if you want to, or even more regularly. So that was done very rapidly and is again an example of the sorts of value you can get back from using a totally different data source, 
in some cases that data was open, but then using well understood tools and techniques to get something of value back. A third project, I'm rattling through these, but just want to give you a sense of the kind of the different areas that we're working in. I talked about collaboration with different parts of the system. So one of the groups that we're looking to collaborate with is industry partners, so commercial organisations. Recognising that many commercial organisations have huge and interesting data sources on the real world. So we want to understand the, about, understand about the economy. Clearly the Bank of England Treasury and folks talk to the banks. Those sorts of groups have very interesting, very powerful data. There's clearly a question here of all of us wanting our data to be absolutely secure. I'm a, I'm a user of banks and so on, clearly. I don't want my data kind of you know, leaking out anywhere. So those sorts of quick conversations are very much around can we run aggregate analysis on the data in the system? The sort of thing that the banks might do already, but with some support from economists and so on at ONS to help support and kind of understand what could you do with bank data, with financial data? Can you use payments data as a proxy for retail sales, which is a big component of GDP measures and economic indicators? Or private household consumption, similarly a big component. Or indeed, could we use this to improve the accuracy of our, of our current estimates of GDP? Now that's a big question, and I'll come to that in a moment. But you've got a huge opportunity here. So we've been collaborating with Barclays, and indeed two of the ONS economists are being seconded in to run, data, run analysis on aggregate level data. They'll never see anybody's individual sources. Data's not going to be shared outside. But again, with this public good aspect, if this gives us a faster readout on sectors of the economy that are doing well or doing less well, or bits of the economy that are changing, then again, this is huge value. And the huge value is this. So the Bank of England estimated that if we'd known about the downturn in 2008 more rapidly, we would have saved the economy 12 billion quid. And that's the current sort of you know, work, working thing. That's 12 billion pounds just of value of faster data. Because the, the impact of the downturn is massive, massive. It's, you know, that's a small component. But that's 12 billion pounds in terms of pure value of data. So if you can produce faster estimates, better estimates of things like big changes in the economy, you can then make decisions faster. That might be changes to interest rates. It might be changing the sort of access to finance, other aspects as well. Policymakers, Bank of England, decision makers and so on can take faster action. So there's, there's a huge win here, yeah. Um, so we're looking, as you'd expect, at pretty much any data source that we have access to, to say, can we get leading or faster indicators of the economy? And in this case, looking at VAT data from companies, which again, very interesting one, another data source in. So I won't go into too much detail on all of the projects, but just to give you a sense of that's a big area of interest for the campus, but also ONS. A couple of other examples of totally different types of data. The first is around movement. <coughs> Every ship in the world above a certain weight has GPS online data, which is used essentially for collision avoidance and so on, which is fed back up and collected by central systems, updated in some cases every minute or, more, or even more rapidly. What this gives you is a, a real-time view on movement of trade of goods around the system, around the world. We've accessed this through the, the Marine and Coast Guard Agency under data sharing and used that to categorise and classify how ships move and what the impact is if we've got ports with, with lots of activity going on. Our question here is, again, and this, this is a sort of early stage project, we published the initial work and we're going on to look at more uh, um, kind of uh, particular questions. But one of those questions is, does this tell us about the way that trade is working? Again, do we get leading indicators of trade from this sort of a activity? So again, totally different in indicators based on very different types of data. Very interesting for us for all sorts of reasons. Final one, just want to say, we know that movement of goods is important, but the UK economy is primarily services and services often operate through the, through the web. So if you're talking about movement, then you should be also talking about bandwidth and the kind of use and consumption of internet, you know, consumption of, of internet bandwidth. So that, again, is a very interesting one. I hadn't got any re recent data from this current World Cup, but this shows 
patterns of bandwidth use, internet usage during a previous World Cup that we were able to grab data on, and you get different changes over time. You get the same changes over time if you look at commuter flows, when, when people come on and off using email, using internet. Again, this is aggregate stuff. It's not using individuals, but it's a very interesting signal into trying to understand the patterns and changes in the economy. So I'm going to kind of roll it up there because the, what I've hopefully shown you is lots of interesting information or interesting ways to try and understand the world. So the ONS is looking at the economy, looking at society, and look, trying to understand what you can do with different sources of data to improve the knowledge so that we can publish better statistics at, over time. And very much kind of the data science tools and so on underpin a lot of that. So I'll leave it there and hopefully time for a few questions. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you very much, Tom. Uh, we probably have time for one or two questions. Are there any in the room first? There's always one. Okay. Thanks, Tom. Uh, I'm Fiona Collin. I come from a local government background. I was struck by your comments about um, the problem with failure and fear of failure. How do you think data science can perhaps help to help government, both at national and local level, to get over that? Because mm. they got to. Hmm. There might be a question around how do you encourage innovation in, in public sector, whether it's local authorities or wherever. So I joined government after last year, after being in industry for 10 years, you know, launching a spin out from Oxford University and then working in academia before that. And government often sort of sees itself quite risk averse and gets a little kind of bad rap in many cases. But actually there's a lot of stuff going on within local authorities, within central government. So I think often what you've got, you're doing is about in allowing that to happen or giving it a bit of space to happen and then saying, okay, if some of these things aren't going to work, we'll still look at them and celebrate. So the idea of retrospectives on your projects and it not being about you know, who's, blame, who's to blame, but actually what did we learn, what can we bring forward? So obviously I haven't got a kind of hard answer to that, but I absolutely recognise that problem. I think the Data Science Canvas was aimed at building a, a group that had this explicitly, but then with the, we want to help other teams in ONS also do that, because we know there's good stuff going on, and essentially say it's okay, you know. Some of those things aren't going to work, that's fine, yeah. So, yeah. Sorry, I, is that working? Oh, I see. Um, so, are there currently any sources of data that you cannot access, but that you think would be hugely valuable for public good projects, this type ah, of thing? Great question. Tons. Um, I suppose, yeah, okay, so my, I started my career, I was trained as a physicist, but I then got involved in what you can do with government benefit systems. So working in the university department, we were starting to use housing benefit as a proxy for deprivation and poverty. We used that to produce models, and this was back in the sort of early 90s. That, at that time, using those data sources was kind of inconceivable to lots of people, because they're seen as data sources they use to run a service. They're part of the administrative system. You roll it forwards, and I think probably it's pretty, you know, there's a wide understanding that most data sources have some kind of value over and above what they're being originally collected for. And so pretty much any, for me, any administrative data source or so service source that's used to deliver a service is of interest. Now, that doesn't mean that we would have access to it. In many cases, understandably and rightly so, but Look at, think about shopping. You know, inflation rates are based on what we buy because if you buy different things and those and prices of things are changing at different levels, you still need to know, well, what are people buying? So anything we buy, that's kind of the potential information about how do you produce an accurate inflation rate, which then goes into how much should salaries go up or mortgages or whatever. Anything around what we're saying or doing, that's essentially some sort of set indicator of, of sentiment so I'm going to, oh, I'm going shopping, or whatever it is, is an indicator of the economy, or you know, mood and, is, and you know, sentiment around health and well-being, and, and things like mental health levels. All of those are very powerful data sources, but again, understandably really sensitive. So my answer is there are going to be loads of things that we won't have access to, rightly, but I think probably most of them will have value in some way. So I'd love to see access made without given the, the raw data out. And I think that's something, certainly something that government is, is looking hard at. 
Okay. Yeah, you, you you mentioned about uh, skill development in your um, wh what kind of uh, skill development that ODI offers or can be accessible please okay so I don't know so much about what the ODI is offer offering um, what the data science campus looks at is skill development for government and public sector so we run or support courses and training across many government departments and in many cases that's about training the trainers rather than actually coming in and doing it because there's half a million civil servants that's kind of a big a big question some of the areas that we're looking at though we will be publishing or producing material for other trainers or other people to follow so it'd be likely that our, some of our training courses will go up on some of the standard online systems be something to kind of keep an eye out for um, we also give kind of public courses and public kind of lectures and so on around what we're doing. Um, but the short answer is in terms of kind of general public, we haven't yet got a, an offer kind of out, if you like. Um, but for any area of government and public sector, there's certainly kind of a, a support available. Um, and if you are interested in learning opportunities at the ODI, then there are lots of courses on the website, so you can find oh, them there. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Um, how are we doing for time? Well, one more? Go on, one more yeah. and then, yeah. Sorry, if you could just wait for the mic. Okay. Sorry, I was just curious what you think the impact of Brexit will be, and also um, Eurostat has come into a lot of criticism, justifiably so, over the years. How do you see, again, data beyond UK shores and how it will work post-Brexit? Yep. I, I obviously can't comment on Brexit itself and kind of policy aspects. I'm looking very interestingly at what will come out today. Um, in terms of the sort of statistical system, ONS is part of the European stats agencies and statistical groups, but we're also part of worldwide statistical agencies. So we work a lot with groups in Africa and Americas and so on. So in terms of how we communicate, collaborate and share with other parts of Europe, that is very likely to continue in, you know, in a very similar way or some shape or form, but we don't yet know. It will be part of the discussions and negotiations. What I think is clear, though, is that we do want to continue collaborating with all of the groups across the world that we're, we're working with and that all of the challenges that we have around understanding the economy and understanding the digital economy, kind of sharing and circular movement, movement of goods, that kind of stuff, the common questions and common challenges. So actually you're likely to have standard approaches and, sh and keep sharing knowledge there. So sh I guess that was a kind of a long way of saying, I don't know, but I would expect it to carry on in a very similar way to today, whether or not that's through the same groups and structures. Excellent. Um, I think that's all we have time for. So thank you again, Tom. And uh, please join us next week. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Cheers. Thank you.